Our Bible lesson for this morning is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 46 to 55. Luke 1, 46 to 55. This is right after the angel announced to Mary about Jesus. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the loneliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Now we ask you, Lord, that you enable me to communicate your word. Give me grace during this time. And help people to understand what you have to tell them. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we live in a time, and we are living in a time that is marked by self-centered attitude. And I, I, I'm repeating this, but this is, the, this is the right thing. Different names are given to this generation that we are living right now. They call Generation Me. They call Entitled uh, Generation. Uh, generation. They call Narcissistic Generation. And then uh, it's uh, very interesting. And, uh, a professor, Gene Twenge, at San Francisco University has this to say. We need to stop endless repeating. You are special and having children repeated bad. Said a study led by author Professor Gene Twenge of San Diego University. Kids are self-centered and not already. So he said, stop saying that. Our generation is marked for the attitude of entitlement. We deserve, you own me. In an article from Associate Press, we read this. A study asserts that narcissists are more likely to have romantic, romantic relationships that are short-lived, at risk for infidelity, lack emotional war, and to exhibit gameplay, dishonest, and over-controlling and violent behaviors. This is the generation that we're living in. And then again, Wenji goes back, is the author of uh, Generation Me, Why Today's Young Americans Are More Confident, Assertive, Entitled, and More Miserable Than Ever Before. This is the book that he wrote. Said narcissists tend to lack empathy, react aggressively to criticism, and favor self-promotion over healthy others. Right there. An example, he used a very interesting thing because he said that he saw this in the schools. A song commonly sung to the tune of Frehead Jack. Everybody knows Frehead Jack, that song, the French song. And they are singing this in the school, but they are using a different word. The word that they are using is this one here. I'm a special, I'm a special, look at me. Look at, can you believe that they're doing that with our kids? And the kids keep saying that. Yeah, yeah, I'm special. Look at me, look at me. And that is the, that is what we have in our generation. And this attitude, this kind of attitude that we're living in right now in our generation is totally the opposite of grace. Grace. The definition of grace, we all know, the definition of grace is favor undeserved. 
unmerited. This is the best and most simple definition of grace that we can have, undeserved favor. God had a favor for you, and you do not deserve. There is nothing in us that makes us special in God's eyes. Sorry about that. You think that you're pretty, prove you are. You think that you're a nice person, prove you are. But nothing deserves that. Grace is totally God's plan, God's decision, and God's action. And we need to understand that. And Christmas is the proof of that. That grace is something that we do not deserve. It's a favor that we do not deserve. God and He alone decided to send His Son to die for us and make restitution for our sins. So this is why we are going through the songs of Christmas. The songs of Christmas. We saw Elizabeth's song last week. A song of uh, joy. And today we are going to see Mary's song. And, and this song is very famous. It's called the Magnificat. It's a Latin for my soul magnify or magnifies. Also known as the song of Mary. In this song Mary expresses her adoration, gratitude and dedication to God. It also shows that she had a very good understanding of the history, theology and the scripture. And when we think that she was just a teenager girl, this is amazing that she had that kind of knowledge. This song is not about her. This song is about the grace of God toward her. And this is what makes this song so special for her. For us. And this is what we're going to learn today the grace of God through the eyes of Mary. Mary will teach us today about the grace of God and uh, her understanding of the grace of God. So let's take a look at a few, a few steps about the grace of God through the eyes of Mary. Mary's definition of grace, that's the first thing that we're going to learn. The definition of grace for Mary. Grace is God, the Creator, looking down with favor on the loneliness of His servant. That is the, the definition. Verse 48 says, For He has looked with favor on the loneliness of His servant. This is the definition of grace. So let's see what Mary means by grace. The first thing that we learn here is that grace is God, the mighty and holy one, Looking down with favor to human beings. It is not about us. It's about Him. It is God, the mighty one, the powerful one, looking down to you, to me. And we do not deserve. We're all the way there. And she did not deserve. She was all the way there, the end of the line. She was a woman. She was a girl. She was a, 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 a Jew girl. Gets it? He was all the way down. But it's the might of one who does great things for me. This is what she said. So this is one part of the definition. The other part of the definition is grace is God not looking the appearance of weakness of human beings. You know, she is a servant. She's a girl. She's a woman. Grace is God not paying attention to the appearance and weakness of human beings. Beings, but God doesn't look that. Maybe you think oh, God's not going to pay attention to me. I'm too poor. I'm old. I'm sick. I'm this. I'm that. I'm Brazilian. Ah, God's not don't care for Brazilians. Don't care for Europeans and Americans. Forget Brazilians. No, God looks to everyone. That's the plan. That's the idea. That's the goal. That's the beauty of grace. The appearance. God is not looking for the appearance. He has looked down with favor to the loneliness. He has brought down the powerful, she said, from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And one more thing about the definition of grace for Mary. Grace is accompanied by salvation, mercy, and great things. That is, that's good that we need to know that grace does not come alone. Grace, grace from God always comes with a lot of good stuff. And this is 
is like she's saying that I, I have mercy, I have grace, I have mercy, I have good things, I have a lot of stuff. God is giving a lot of good stuff to each one of us. This, this is grace manifest. It's mercy for those who fear from generation. Mine has done great things for me. Great things for me. So that is the definition of grace for Mary. But there is one more other things about grace for Mary. For Mary, grace produces fear of God. That's very interesting. Mary saying that that grace produces fear. He produced fear because of his power and his holiness. If you read that, there is a sense of fear, reverence. She is in the presence of the power, the mighty one. Is holy. God is God. The reason for fear is because of His power and His holiness. God is God. He is not only powerful, He is holy. And we are sinners. And that puts us in a different category. And we need to understand that. You don't talk to God on the same level. God is all the way out there, and we are all the way down here. And we need to understand that Mary understood that. Mary understood that. Produce fear. But not only that, produce fear because of his disregard for the proud, powerful, and rich. Yes, produce fear because she could see what God would do and was doing with the powerful, with the rich, with the bride. She was witnessing that. So that we need to understand that when we see God dealing with people that are powerful, more powerful than we are, they're powerful, nothing compared with God's power. The idea is God does not care about the powerful people on earth, it's because He's more powerful than they are. And this is what He this is what she says. He has shown his strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lift up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. This is God. He doesn't care. And this is why we should fear him because he disregards the proud, the powerful, and the rich. But we should fear for one more thing because of his promise and word. Third place, grace for Mary is based on God's promise and his word. God made a commitment with us, and we should fear that. God will fulfill his commitment. Whatever he said, every promise, <coughs> Paul says that every promise that is made for us in Christ Jesus has an amen. That means it's true. God will fulfill that promise. According to the promise, verse 55, He made our ancestor to Abraham and to his descendant. And this is, it's beautiful to understand that. But there is one more thing that Mary wants us to learn about grace. That grace produces adoration. When we understand that grace is the powerful and holy God looking down to each one of us, all the way down. And some of us, he looked kind of, he looked, he, he, yeah, he kind of, he, where? Yeah, yeah, get out of here. Yeah. To the end of the line. Yes, is the powerful and holy God looking down to the lonely. One all the way there. When we understand that, we will worship. We will praise. We will adore. And this is what she's doing here. And, 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 and that is very important what she's telling us here because this kind of adoration comes from inside. It's not something external that we do or we just sing, we just stand up and sing a song. No! Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices something inside. The worship must be from inside out. 
He's not just coming here to sing and say some words. No, it's more than that. It's our heart. It's our soul. It's, it's our spirit singing and praising the Lord. Mary puts her heart on it. The other thing about adoration is that adoration recognizes who God is. Here we find all the right words, verse 46, 47, 49, and 50. We found all the right words to address God. Mary knew what she was talking about. Calling God, Lord, Lord God, my Savior, mighty one, holy, merciful. She has all the words, the right words. She knows what she's talking about. She knows God. Adoration recognizes who God is. When we adore God, we come before you, for him, before him, and we say, you are this, you are holy, you are merciful, you are gracious, you are kind, you are compassionate, you are powerful, you are mighty. And those are the words that she used, she recognized who God is. So when we worship God, we recognize who he is and what he does. And finally, adoration is a kind of adoration that people will testify about. People will talk about. Verse 48, she, goes, she, she, she says this, For he has looked with favor to the loneliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Yes, what God did in her life made people throughout history call her blessed. And this is what we have to learn with her. God is doing something in your life, in my life, and people around us should see and call us blessed. You are blessed. You are blessed from God. God has been good to you. They have to recognize that. God has been blessed. Good to you. God has blessed you. This is what she did. Adoration when we praise and worship God. People will talk about what God is doing in our lives. They're going to they're gonna talk about that. So these are just few lessons that we learned from this small but powerful song of Mary. Grace is the most important thing in our life. It is by grace that we are saved, by grace that we are forgiven, it is by grace that we have access to God through prayer, it is by grace that we endure all the temptations and trials, it is by grace that we will be able to live a real Christian life, it is by grace that we will finally enter into His eternal kingdom. And my prayer is that not only you, but you and your whole family during this time would experience the grace of God through this. Let us bow our heads and let us pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for Mary. We thank you for this song. So rich. So powerful. Help us to learn about your grace. Help us to live by your grace. We pray in the name.